Thank you all so much for coming. Um, my name is Harriet O'Neill, and I'm um, the Assistant Director for Humanities and Social Sciences here at the British School at Rome. Uh, but more importantly, I'm, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Ian Campbell from Queen's University Belfast to the BSR. Um, and what should I say? He's been uh, uh, in Belfast since 2014, but he'll be a familiar face to many of you because Ian has been using uh, the BSR um, as a base for his current research project, which is War and the Supernatural in Early Modern Europe. And the impressive thing about this is that it won an, uh, a European Research Council award of 1.3 million euros, so well done. Um, as principal investigator on this project, Ian is leading a team to examine the relationship between debates inside the early modern European universities on the proper limits of the natural and supernatural and the character of religious warfare in 16th and 17th century Europe. But tonight he's going to tell us about a central component of the project, which will also be uh, the theme of his book, and that's the history of Franciscan thought in 17th century Rome, and particularly how they engage with theolo theological heritage of John Duns Scotus. So over to you, Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Harriet. Um, that's a very kind introduction. The BSR has indeed been a very happy home for me every second two weeks uh, since February, um, when I began, last February, when I began coming to Rome. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to the BSR and to the director and assistant directors for the invitation to speak. And it's a great pleasure to see so many familiar faces and friends in the audience this evening. Um, I realize I am in Rome and I am speaking in English. Um, uh, and I don't think anyone would want, would want to hear me speak Italian for 45 minutes. But it would be a great pleasure to receive questions in Italian afterwards if anyone would like to ask one. I think I can probably just understand. So, let me begin. The Franciscans were a Christian brotherhood who emerged from the followers of St. Francis of Assisi in the late 12th century. St. Francis and his followers tried to live as Christ's disciples, owning nothing, exercising no worldly power, and living lives of simplicity and hardship. These Franciscan friars lived differently to monks. Monks attempt an elite spiritual life cut off from human society. By contrast, friars responded to the growth of cities in 12th century Europe by seeking to evangelize ordinary people, making their doctrine of apostolic poverty part of the urban fabric. Although always a little suspicious of higher learning as a worldly vanity, Franciscan teachers began to establish a system of education for young friars to help them preach effectively. It was within this system that Franciscan intellectuals wrote books explaining and analyzing the Franciscan way of being Christian, especially defending their doctrine of poverty against their critics within the church. Among these Franciscan theologians was John Dunn Scotus, born in the Scottish borders in the late 13th century, and later a teacher of theology to young friars at the universities of Oxford and Paris. Over the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, this Scotus theology became dominant among Franciscans, and Scotus doctrines were taught to many hundreds of young friars across Europe every year in dozens of Franciscan colleges. This Scotus theology incorporated distinctive positions on the origins of human society, natural law, the nature of human excellence, evangelization by force, and holy war. Franciscan friars educated by Scotists played a vital role as preachers and confessors to the European elite, and thus conversed with princes about war making and peacemaking. But their special relationship with the poor endured, and they were often deeply embroiled in popular violence and sectarian rioting as Christendom collapsed into rival factions during the 16th century. The friars were also indispensable to the Spanish and Portuguese empires that reached perhaps the height of their power in the 17th century. We thus have strong reasons grounded in social and political history to ask what these friars were taught about politics in their colleges. I'm currently writing a history of Scotist political thought in Baroque Rome both because there was a lot of Scotism going on in the city at the time, 
and because the archives of the Roman institutions dedicated to theological control and censorship tell me what non-Franciscans thought about Scotism. The College of St. Bonaventure uh, was founded in the conventual Franciscan convent of Santi Dodici Apostoli, there it is, a little north of Piazza Venezia, in 1587. And I begin my story when the first students of this college came to professional maturity in the early 17th century. Friars like Filippo Fabri, Bartolomeo Mastri, and Angelo Volpi. In 1625, this institution was joined by a new college of observant Franciscans, the College of St. Isidore, an institution that owed its existence to the efforts of the extremely forceful and learned Irish observant Franciscan, Luke Wadding. There he is on the right. In both these institutions, St. Bonaventure's and St. Isidore's, the study of Scotus theology was carried on at a high level. Now, according to its original constitution, the College of St. Bonaventure was indeed supposed to teach St. Bonaventure's theology. But we have plenty of good biographical and institutional evidence that, in fact, a Scotist curriculum was taught. Over at St. Isidore's, Wadding led an accomplished team during the late 1630s who edited and commented on the complete works of John Dunn Scotus. This resulted in a 12-volume edition finally printed at Lyon in 1639. This was the environment in which theologians like Antony Hickey, John Punch, and Bonaventure Barron studied and taught. There were other institutions of Franciscan learning uh, that appeared and disappeared across Rome during the 17th century, like the Studia at Santa Maria Aracelli and San Pietro del Monte but these did not produce the kind of theologians who wrote big books. And it was Franciscans from St. Bonaventure's and St. Isidore's who interacted most with the Roman Inquisition and the Congregation of the Index of Forbidden Books, both acting as censors of other people's books and also being censored themselves. It's with the placing of Angelo Volpi's massive 12 volume summa, textbook really, of Scotus theology on the index of forbidden books in the 1710s and 1720s that my story ends. My aim this evening is to give you an impression of what made this Scotus political theory most distinctive and different to other 17th century Catholic political <coughs> theories and thus give you some idea of why I think writing this book might be useful. First I'll explain what historians have, how historians have understood Scotism up to this point. The second part of my paper will turn to the founder of this tradition, John Dunn Scotus, and explain his most controversial political doctrine. Scotus argued that Christian governments were obliged to confiscate Jewish children and baptize them without their parents' consent. I'll also outline two hostile Catholic responses to this doctrine, one advanced by a Dominican, the other advanced by a Jesuit. In the third part of my paper, I'll return to 17th century Rome and to three Franciscans who operated in the Roman system, Filippo Fabri, Antony Hickey, and John Punch. I'll also try and say something about ordinary people, Jews and other people, in the real Rome in which these scholars lived. Then in the fourth and final part of my paper, I'll review what the Congregation of the Index thought of this Scotus doctrine of forced baptism and other Scotus doctrines more generally in order, in order to judge the importance of these doctrines in the church as a whole in the 17th century. To begin the first part of my paper then, Scotism sits at quite a strange junction between Catholicism and modernity. In 1879, Pope Leo XIII promulgated his encyclical Aeterni Patris, which privileged Thomas Aquinas over others in the Catholic theological tradition. This neo-Thomist theology tended to argue that there was a supernatural sphere in which God intervened directly in human life, and there was also a natural sphere where God left humans free 
to use their divinely granted reason to do science, philosophy, and politics. Scotus was entirely excluded from this project. It was commonplace for 19th and early 20th century historians of scholasticism, uh, the learning of the universities, Christian theology, to dismiss any theology which deviated from neo-Thomism as unorthodox, decadent, or dangerous. So in 1922, the French scholar Bernard Landry concluded that the human society which Scotus envisaged was more Islamic than Christian, right down to forced conversion, what he called Madism, and holy war. Now, the most recent historians of Scotism have been very anxious to distance themselves from these sort of lurid critiques. A lack of engagement with Duns Scotus' argument for the confiscation of Jewish children is just one mark of this. Very learned scholars like Maurice de Gondelac, Roberto Lambertini, Alan Walter, and Luca Parisolli have offered their readers a liberal Scotus, whose account of the origins of human society was intended to make property optional for humans. Since, according to Scotus, property was artificial and not natural, humans could choose to own property or, like the friars, choose not to own it. Later medieval Franciscans developed this doctrine into a very impressive account of a proto-capitalist market society, which was all about the, the constant transfer of ownership from one person to another. But this reluctance to look Scotus's anti-Judaism squarely in the face has now received very fierce criticism from Elsa Mamutsain and Sylvain Piron. Their article on the subject in 2004 included the very first critical edition of the crucial passage of Scotus's argument where he made this, uh, where he established this position. Indeed, Mamutsain and Piron argued that the real center of Scotus's political thought lay in his answer to this particular question, quote, whether the children of Jews and unbelievers might be baptized with the parents unwilling, unquote. Elsa Mamutsain has since expanded this work into a, a big long durée history of forced conversion stretching from Scotus to the aftermath of the Second World War, published just last year. This argument that we should seek the real heart of Scotus's vision of human life in his remarks on Jewish children is an important one, and I hope to address it in what follows. Now let me turn to the second part of my paper and Scotus's argument that the secular prince was obliged to baptize Jewish children and the children of other unbelievers without their parents' permission. It formed part of his Oxford lectures composed between 1300 and 1304. My colleague in Belfast, Dr. Todd Rester, is currently working on an edition of Scotus writings on politics, which will include the first English translation of this question and of the 17th century commentary on it by Anthony Hickey. Now, Thomas Aquinas had argued that it would be unjust for a private person to confiscate the children of unbelievers from their parents for baptism on the grounds that the parents had a natural right in their children and the good of conversion could not justly be achieved at the cost of an injury to that right. But Scotus thought that it was the duty of the prince to adjudicate between clashing rights in his or her jurisdiction. And Scotus continued, quote, God has a greater right of lordship than the parents in the child. Unquote. Because the prince was obliged to be most zealous for protecting the lordship of the supreme lord, God, it was not just lawful but obligatory for the prince to remove children from non-Christian parents in order to direct the children towards the worship of God. Now let me turn to two powerful critics of Scotus, one a Dominican friar, the other a Jesuit. The Dominican friar and cardinal, Tommaso di Vio, known as Cayetanus, composed his commentary on Aquinas while lecturing at Padua, about 1500. In this commentary, Cayetanus responded to Scotus in full 
Caetanus wrote that God had not instituted the law of faith in such a way as to dissolve the law of nature, as the Gospels tell us on multiple occasions to respect natural law and obey the commands even of pagan monarchs. Christ said, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. So it would be wrong to try and measure the right of the parents against the right of God. Rather, we must consider that God instituted both the order of nature and the order of faith. And we can easily prove that he did not want faith to dissolve nature. So it would be against natural justice to remove and baptize the children as one cannot do unjust things in order that good might result. The Jesuit critic I want to address is Francisco Suarez, whose commentary on the third part of Aquinas' Summa was printed first in 1590, when he was teaching at Alcalá in Spain, having completed five years at the Jesuits' Roman college. Like Cayetanus, Suarez too portrays Scotus as arguing that the prince should deprive the parents of, the, of their existing right because God's right is greater. Suarez's reply to Scotus is constructed along the same lines as that of the Dominican cardinal, but is slightly more political in orientation. Suarez wrote that the power of the prince had its near origin in the natural reason that humans possess, and for this reason the prince's power is ordered towards natural justice alone. But the law of baptism, says Suarez, is of the supernatural order. And so it is not proper to human power to force the observance of baptism. Suarez concludes, quote, the infidel parent who does not allow the baptism either of himself or his child does not violate the right of kings nor anything else that is merely natural, unquote. One point here is vital. Scotus strongly implied that the Jewish parents had a right in their child until the prince decided against them. It was this right that would have made it wrong for a private person to have confiscated the child or the children. The prince had to do the confiscating. Only the prince could adjudicate between clashing rights. Both Cayetanus and Suarez read Scotus in this way. Later Scotists would understand this quite differently. Now, in the third part of my paper, I'd like to zoom in on early 17th century Rome. When the Franciscan family had split into observant and conventual factions um, at the beginning of the 16th century, the conventuals had lost control of some of their order's most prestigious teaching institutions, like the Great Convent at Paris. The conventuals needed new and comparatively prestigious uh, institutions of learning in order to survive. Meanwhile, the Irish observant Franciscans needed new seminaries for training, for training young friars following the imposition of the Protestant Reformation on Ireland in the 16th century. And the Protestant Reformation had also created a new need for the establishment of a single infallible criterion for religious orthodoxy inside Catholicism, a new sorting and ordering of medieval theological tradition to meet the Protestant threat. The Counter-Reformation papacy ensured that Rome was a place where this sorting and ordering would take place. The reorganized Roman Inquisition and the new index of forbidden books played a central role in this determination of orthodoxy. The papal court also began targeting certain problematic nations, the Greeks, the Germans and Hungarians, the English and so on by founding or reforming national colleges. And also they encouraged the, the papacy encouraged the major religious orders to expand their teaching provisions. It was in this environment that the Franciscans found themselves engaged in a struggle with the Dominicans and Jesuits to prevent Franciscan theology and therefore the Franciscan way of being religious from being marginalized or even smothered. All these forces came together in the foundation of the College of St. Bonaventure in 1587 by Pope Sixtus V and the foundation of the Irish Observant College of St. Isidore by Urban VIII in 1625. One of the first students of the conventional College of St. Bonaventure 
was Filippo Fabri. Unfortunately, I have no portrait of Filippo. Born in the Romagna and educated first at Faenza, Cremona, Ferrara, and Padua, he entered the college in 1589 and received his doctorate in theology from the Minister General of the Conventuals in, in 1593. Fabri's friend and biographer, Matthias Ferchius, emphasized that the College of St. Bonaventure was a Scotist environment. Fabri was later appointed by the Venetian Republic to the Scotus Chair in Metaphysics at the University of Padua in 1603, and then moved to the Chair in Theology, which he held until his death in 1630. Ferchius described um, Fabri, his friend, as a tall, strongly built man, pale from overwork. Fabri's four-volume Disputationes Theologicae was first printed in Venice in 1613, and it contained an innovative defense of Scotus's doctrine of forced baptism. Fabri integrated Scotus's natural law doctrine with his thinking on Jews and baptism, and all the other 17th century Scotists would follow his approach. Scotus, Scotus's natural law theory was really very different to that of Aquinas. Aquinas thought that God's reason inclined all the things in the universe to their natural purposes. In the human case, God's reason inclined humans to preserve their own lives, preserve the species, worship God, and live together in human society. Because humans were rational, they understood their own natural purposes. And so humans could understand that there were natural laws against murder, against the destruction of the family and other sexual crimes, against blasphemy and the destruction of the state. No lawmaker needed to tell humans that these things were wrong. All humans just knew that they were wrong. Aquinas clearly believed that this natural law applied to all human beings, even the most lowly and vulnerable female slave. And because this natural law was an extension of God's own nature, God never revoked it. It was valid forever. Scotus disliked very strongly all this talk of natural purposes because he thought that if one were naturally inclined to an action, that action was not free and therefore not moral. Scotus's natural law was a series of commands more or less evident to human reason, which one either chose to obey or chose to disobey. And he didn't think that Aquinas' scheme could account for the fact that there were many biblical examples of God overruling the natural law for his own purposes, as when he commanded Abraham to kill his son Isaac. So when Scotus divided the natural law in two, so for this reason, Scotus divided the natural law in two into strong natural law and weak natural law. The command, God must be worshipped, is strong natural law. It is logically self-evident, because since God is infinitely good, of course he must be worshipped. God could never revoke this law himself, because it would be self-contradictory. The weak natural laws include do not kill or do not steal. And these seem good to human reason in a way that parking regulations or other silly little human laws do not. But these weak natural laws, do not kill, do not steal, are not logically self-evident in the same way as God must be worshipped. So God will revoke them when he needs to, to achieve his purposes. And Fabry explained that when, <coughs> when Christ issued the positive law of baptism, commanding, quote, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, unquote. This was simply an elaboration of the natural law to worship God. The natural law to worship God and the positive command to baptize were wholly complementary and in no way contradictory. So the natural law told the Father to care for the salvation of his Son. Christ's commandment told the father how to achieve this. And if anyone were then to force a father or a mother to baptize his or her child, he would be forcing him merely to observe the natural law, not to violate the law of nature. 
So our initial reading of Scotus suggested that Scotus thought that the parents had a right which was weaker than God's right, and Cayetanus and Suarez also seem to have read Scotus that way. The Thomist defense against this was to say that grace does not destroy nature. God's love does not destroy the natural world and does not destroy natural rights. By resorting to Scotus's natural law theory, Fabry adjusted and reinforced Scotus's original position, insisting that as soon as the parents tried to act against a divine command, at that moment they had no right whatsoever. Fabry found it inconceivable that any natural right could exist contrary to divine command, because all natural right had its origin in divine command. Fabry's innovative argument was vital to later 17th century Scotism, and it was typical of the new Counter-Reformation theology, systemizing the medieval tradition, strengthening what theologians saw as core doctrines, and filing away the irregularities. For this reason, while I agree with Mahmoudsein and Piron that forced baptism was an extremely important Scotist political doctrine, I don't think it can be separated from the Franciscans' natural law theory, at least not in the later Scotus tradition. I'd now like to turn to the, the Irish Franciscan Anthony Hickey to explore the relationship between this Franciscan doctrine that encouraged the use of force in evangelization and the Jewish community in Rome. And for Hickey, we have a portrait from St. Isidore's, probably completely impossible. Yes. So that's what happens when you take a photograph of a fresco with an iPhone, uh, a smudge. But St. Isidore's has a beautiful, beautiful uh, debating hall, basically, in which the friars would debate theology. And in the 1670s, these uh, really interesting uh, frescoes, uh, portraits of all of the major theologians at St. Isidore's were uh, painted um, around the edge of the debating hall. Um, and what you should be looking at there is a rather Irish-looking man with a tonsure, and that is Anthony Hickey. The 1639 Wadding edition of Scotus's Opera Omnia contains Scotus's question on forced baptism and a commentary on this question by Anthony Hickey. Hickey had been educated at Louvain before teaching theology both at Louvain and at Cologne. The Minister General of the Order sent Hickey to Rome to assist Wadding in 1619. Hickey's commentary was probably composed during the 1630s. But despite the fact that the outline of Hickey's argument was very close to Fabry, Hickey did not cite Fabry among his sources, which might possibly be due to a sense of competition with, the conventional, with his conventional cousins, perhaps. Um, like Fabry, Hickey denied that there was any conflict of rights between the parent and God because no natural right could exist which was contrary to a, to a divine command. By natural reason, he wrote, all parents all across the world understand they must teach their children to worship God. Then, Hickey continued, when they hear the divine command to baptize, parents know that they must baptize their children. Anyone to whom the faith is preached but still does not choose to receive it, sins. Hickey went on, quote, but unbelievers under a Christian prince and living among Christians cannot pretend ignorance of faith or baptism as experienced teachers because they are forced in many places to hear the preaching of the faith and the mystery and necessity of baptism as in the case of the Jews of Rome. Therefore, such people are bound by natural precept to provide for their children with regard to, to baptism. And consequently, they have no right to educate their children against that precept to those children's destruction and damnation." Unquote. The Roman ghetto, with a population of between three and 4,000 Jews, was indeed a 15 or 20 minute walk from St. Isidore's. It had been established in 1555. Pope Paul III had founded the House of Catechumens about a decade before. This was a, 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 a community of 12 secular priests under a rector who were tasked with the conversion of infidels of all kinds and especially the Jews of Rome. Christian sermons, attendance at which was compulsory for all Jews, began in the ghetto in 1584 
the House of Catechumens baptized about 10 converts a year in the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, in the archive of the Roman Inquisition, there is a series of manuscript volumes dealing with doubts about the administration of the sacraments, intended to ask, act as a resource for the Inquisition's future decisions. One of these volumes is a collection of cases about baptism from 1618 to 1698. Many of these cases concern doubtful baptisms of Jews, doubtful often because of uncertainty about the consent of the parents to the baptism of the child. It was very common for a Christian servant or nursemaid in a Jewish household to take pity on a child and secretly baptize them, telling their priest only about it later, a case that might be referred up to the local bishop, and then, if he didn't want to make a decision, referred up again to the Roman Inquisition for a decision, ultimately. But I'll offer a Roman example that illustrates the kind of violence and confusion that might be involved in these forcible baptisms. In early July 1641, the leaders of the Jewish community in Rome petitioned Pope Urban VIII for justice. A Jewish convert to Christianity, now called Ignazio, had become obsessed with a married Jewish woman named Canossa. She had rejected him, and in his fury, uh, Ignazio went with some hired witnesses to the rector of the House of Catechumens and testified that Canossa had uh, expressed a desire to convert to Christianity. The rector then entered the ghetto with a body of armed men and grabbed Canossa, holding other children hostage until Canossa's own children were produced. Canossa and her children were then removed from the ghetto and they were all held separately. Canossa was eventually released after repeatedly insisting that she did not want to convert to Christianity. The Jewish community demanded the immediate release of both children, a boy and a girl, on the basis that it was contrary to civil law, canon law, and the custom of the church that children should be baptized against their parents' will. While the parents were appealing to the Cardinal Vicar, who stood in for the Pope as Bishop of Rome, and from there to the Inquisition, the rector acted all by himself and baptized Canossa's little boy. The Jewish community demanded that this baptism be recognized as invalid as the boy was far from the age of consent and parental consent had been totally absent. A decision was made at a special meeting of the Inquisition on the 8th of July, 1641. The meeting appears to have been led by Niccolo Ridolfi, who was master of the sacred palace a senior Dominican theologian in the papal household. He was assisted by Francesco Albizzi as assessor, or the Inquisition's chief lawyer. The, the Inquisition decreed that the rector had proceeded rashly and unlawfully and would have to be punished for his actions in some unspecified way. Jewish adults accused of desiring baptism were not to be taken to the House of Catechumens immediately, but calmly examined by some judge outside the ghetto to avoid, to avoid future cases of fraud like this. Hiding, holding innocent Jews hostage in order to capture the denounced was also forbidden, and no one must be baptized by the rector without the permission of the cardinal vicar. But the Inquisition also decreed that the baptism of the boy was valid, it had been carried out in the correct manner, and so he was to remain in the house of catechumens and be instructed in Christianity. Now, these decrees of July 1641 did not cite any technical theology. Although in 1627, the Archbishop of Siena had written to Rome asking for advice on a similar case, and he had cited both Aquinas and Scotus on the problem. But in the case of Canossa's little boy, the dominant theology is very clearly Thomist, drawn from Thomas Aquinas. The dominant voice in making the decision is very likely to have been the Dominican Rodolfi, despite the fact that a conventional Franciscan consultor from Santi Apostoli was present at the meeting. Aquinas had indeed insisted that it was wrong to baptize children without their parents' consent, but he had also insisted that if the baptism was carried out correctly, it was valid. The same theology and the same church policy is evident throughout the rest of these cases about baptism in the 17th century. But a lot of ordinary people, ignorant, of scholastic theology 
thought that baptism was such a great good that it would be crazy to deny it to a baby because of its parents' erroneous religious beliefs. The way that the Scotists thought about the problem happened to be similar to the way, intuitively, that many ordinary people thought about the problem. The carefully reasoned positions of Aquinas and Scotus in fact reflected real choices open to real people in 17th century Europe. Now, of these Franciscans working in Rome, it was John Punch, very slightly more distinct photograph than that, um, who first seems to have turned this positive attitude to the use of force in conversion into an advocacy of holy war. Punch had received a very similar formation to Hickey at Louvain and Cologne, gained his higher degree in theology while at St. Isidore's in the late 1620s, and contributed to the commentaries on Scotus for the Opera Omnia of 1639. Punch's lectures at St. Isidore's in the 1630s and 1640s formed the basis for what he con controversially advertised as the very first Scotus theology course, a big volume printed first in 1652. In Punch's disputation on baptism, we find Hickey's arguments in compressed form. The prince was obliged by natural law to baptize the children of unbelievers by force. But in the same textbooks, Punch used exactly the same arguments from natural law to urge Europe's Catholics to wage holy war on their Protestant neighbors. Punch insisted that, quote, it is lawful by war when other means do not avail to reduce unbelievers and much more heretics to such a state that they should not impede the preaching and instruction by means of which they might be converted to the faith, and also so that they should assemble to hear that instruction." Unquote. Because God commanded that we should love our neighbors, Punch wrote, we should do everything lawful to provide them with the faith necessary for eternal life. And if war is lawful to provide people with much lesser goods, so it is lawful to provide such a great good. A set of theological commentaries that were printed in the year of Punch's death, 1661, developed all these arguments at great length and applied them directly to Britain and Ireland. Punch insisted that the Protestant religion of the Stuart kings was enough by itself to justify both their Catholic subjects and neighboring Catholic princes to take up arms against them. Internal evidence indicates that Punch was delivering these arguments in his lectures at St. Isidore's from 1642. Note one thing in particular. There was no place in Punch's holy war doctrine for the Pope. This was not the traditional doctrine of crusade, a war authorized by the Pope. This holy war could be declared by any Catholic prince, and indeed, as Punch explained, by any part of a Catholic kingdom. Punch's holy war doctrine seems to me to belong to an overall inclination on the part of these Franciscans to accelerate the sacralization of the Catholic monarchies in Europe at the expense of papal power, to increase the independence of the Catholic monarchies from papal power. Now, while Punch certainly defended the forced baptism of Jewish children, he never drew a direct line between this and his holy war theory. Nevertheless, two of Punch's Jesuit contemporaries did draw this straight line. Pedro Hurtado de Mendoza taught theology at Salamanca between the 1610s and, the 16, and his death in 1641. Giles de Conning, another Jesuit, taught at Louvain about the same time. In their disputations on moral theology, both insisted that the Scotists favored holy war because of this teaching of Scotus on the forced baptism of Jewish children. And just like Suarez, both these Jesuits thought this marked a very dangerous confusion of natural with supernatural ends. When Bernard Landry wrote in 1922, his ascription of holy war doctrine to the Scotists was merely a sort of hypothesis, I guess. But certainly it is the case that apart from Punch, there were important Scotists operating in 16th and 17th century Europe, like Juan Fauché and Alfonso de Castro, both of whom also advocated holy war along Scotist principles. <laughs>
Forche applied Schultes principles to the Chichimeca American Indians uh, of Mexico. Uh, De Castro applied these Schultes principles to the rebellious Protestant princes of Germany. And John Punch applied them to British and Irish Protestants. There is no doubt that the relationship between the prince and the Jewish family provided Franciscans with an important model when thinking about all relationships between Christians and non-Christians. Now in the fourth part of my paper and final part, I'll ask what the central Roman institutions of theological control made of the Scotist political doctrines. Firstly, there is no doubt that Franciscan theologians felt themselves to be a persecuted minority in a city where the theology of, Dom of Thomas Aquinas was becoming dominant. For example, in a theological commentary printed in Antwerp in 1620, an Irish observant uh, theologian named Hugo Cavellus told a story about a meeting in Rome in 1612. The observance general chapter had taken place in Rome that year and Cavellus was in charge of organizing the printing of various theology theses that um, had been defended at that chapter. But the master of the sacred palace, who was in charge of approving all items to be printed at Rome and was a Dominican friar, as I mentioned, objected to many of these arguments uh, contained in these theses. Cavellus got around the problem, resolved it, but he complained about this whole story to the conventual Franciscan cardinal, Felice Centini, known as Asculanus, who said that some years before, he, Asculanus, had obtained a decree from what he called the Congregation of Cardinals, commanding that the master of the sacred palace was always to allow the printing of Scotus's theology in Rome. Cavellus closed his anecdote by lamenting the literary tyranny that Thomist censors exercised over Scotist theologians. Now, I've searched for this decree both in the decrees of the Inquisition, the decrees of the Index, and the decrees of the Congregation of the Council without success. I'm not the first person to have gone looking for this decree. In 1668, the Irish observant Franciscan Bonaventure Baron reported the, that he had gone looking for this same decree. He had read Cavellus's book too. Um, at the Inquisition, when Francesco Albizzi was assessor, that's between 1637 and 1654, and Baron had found the right book, and he and, uh, he and Albizzi had looked into the right book, and they found that two leaves in the book had been razored out by some sinister person, uh, cut out with scissors. Now, uh, I'm inclined to believe that Cavellus was telling the truth about his conversation with uh, Centini, as he, as he remembered it. I'm a little more inclined to suspect that Baron, who was quite a highly strung man and a very celebrated Neo-Latin poet, may have been embroidering the truth a bit, because I don't really believe this thing about the decree cut out with scissors. But these were not the only Franciscans who felt under pressure in this way. Luke Wadding himself, who was a consultor or theological expert at the index, appears to have lost his temper completely during a meeting of the index in 1657, the year of his death. The diary of the index for this particular meeting, normally a very dry, boring, little formal document, suddenly bursts into reported speech as the notary recorded that Wadding provoked over a dispute over a very obscure minor Franciscan theologian, accused the secretary of the, uh, the, secretary of the congregation, the secretary of the index, of programmatic opposition to Franciscan theology. Very unusual entry. It's interesting that the Franciscans, and perhaps especially these Irish outsiders in Rome, felt persecuted in this way. But in fact, I do not think that the master of the sacred palace or the congregations of the index or inquisition were pursuing a really concerted program of opposition to Scotus theology in the 17th century. I've now searched all the volumes of consultors judgments and all the volumes of decrees for the congregation of the index in the 17th century and no Dominican or Jesuit consultor ever managed to get a Scotist theology book banned by pointing to typical Scotist doctrines about virtue, law, evangelization by force or holy war. These doctrines could be criticized successfully only if the Scotist theologian had made a more profound mistake first. So for example, in 1661, 
the observant Franciscan Raymond Caron's book on missions was blocked by the index because he had exaggerated the powers available to missionaries. But having pointed that out, the consultor could also put the boot in about the doctrine of forced baptism that was contained in the book. More importantly, perhaps, the very prestigious and important conventual Franciscan Angelo Volpi, educated at St. Bonaventure's in the 1610s, had all of his 12-volume summa of Scotus theology placed on the index in the 1710s and 1720s. Volpi favored all the typical Scotist political doctrines, and these were often mentioned in the consultor's reports on his book. But Volpi had been denounced to the index because he subordinated the son to the father in the Trinity. He accused Thomas Aquinas of being a Nestorian heretic. He had Jansenist tendencies in his theology of salvation. He supported the doctrine of philosophical sin, and he granted a jurisdiction of some sort to demons. The consultors certainly disliked his, did, did dislike also his natural law theory and his doctrine of forced evangelization, but those things alone would not have gotten him banned. Now, um, I don't understand completely all the repercussions of Vulpi's disgrace. It's possible that his example may have encouraged 18th century Scotists to moderate and soften their theological positions in general, falling more into line with Thomism, and that may have been what's going on in the work of the conventional Franciscan Cardinal Lorenzo Brancati di Laria. But my big point is this. Scotus theology in general, advanced in print, advanced through Franciscan learned institutions, was a permitted and important part of intellectual life in Rome, and indeed throughout the Catholic Church in the 17th century. While there certainly were Dominicans, Jesuits, and others who thought that this Scotism was mistaken and undesirable, they were not strong enough to silence Scotus theologians. Scotus theologians had their books forbidden by the congregation of the Index only when they advanced views that stood far outside Catholic and indeed Christian orthodoxy. I will conclude. I've argued that Franciscan theologians working within the intellectual tradition established by John Duns Scotus advanced a theology which contained a distinctive political vision. I began by pointing out that, in so far, that insofar as Scotus features in the modern history of political thought, he does so only insofar as he anticipates certain aspects of our modern rights-based society through his theory of property as an artificial human-created pheno phenomenon. This is the liberal Scotus with whom a Cambridge professor might feel at ease. But Scotus's views on the justice of radical state intervention inside the non-Christian family constitutes another aspect of this modernity. It would be very easy to tell this story today, rather as Bernard Landry told it in the 1920s, with Scotist villains and Dominican or Jesuit heroes, in which a bad medieval Scotist theology is defeated in the long term by a good modern Thomist theology. But the Scotism of Filippo Fabri, Anthony Hickey, John Punch, Angelo Volpi, and the others, seems to me to be fiercely modern. Scotus saw society as a field of clashing rights. He diminished the rights of outsiders, and he increased the power of the prince in religious matters. That was the path that Europeans followed in the 18th century. And these doctrines were not just fossilized in a few manuscripts in a small number of libraries. They were approved by the church's censorship procedures. They were printed at great expense. They were institutionalized in college and university curricula and so they were employed in teaching young friars. Those concepts that are embedded in institutions are the ones that possess true cultural power. Thank you. <laughs>